General Turgidson, when you instituted the human reliability test, you assured me there was no possibility of such a thing ever occurring. Well, uh, I don't think it's quite fair to condemn a whole program but just because of a single slip-up, sir. I want to speak with General Ripper on the telephone personally. Uh, I'm afraid that's not possible, sir. General Turgidson, I'm becoming less and less interested in your estimates of what is possible and what's impossible. Welcome to Your Pick, a film podcast. I'm Tatum. And I'm Geneva. We are two friends who love movies and love sharing them with each other. Each week, we take turns picking a film that is close to our hearts and talk about why it moves us, to tears, to laughter, and everything in between. We celebrate the craft of filmmaking, as well as the unique and personal ways we find meaning in the movies we watch. So, uh, Geneva, I love you. Let's try and keep the uh, what we've been watching this week <laughs> section a little bit shorter for you, because I know you've seen, not shorter, mm-hmm. but like maybe don't talk about everything that you've seen. No, I wasn't going to do that. So uh, uh, yeah, get it started I, for us. Yeah, absolutely. So I just went to a film festival. It is the first film festival I've ever been to, and it was super fun. And if you love movies, I highly recommend going to a film festival. Though I will say one caveat. Uh, so the the film festival that I went to was the Provincetown Film Festival in Cape Cod, New England. Beautiful little town, um, super fun, amazing energy to be there. Extremely expensive, <laughs> mm, yeah. very very expensive. So uh, keep that in mind. But anyway, I had a great time. Um, I watched so many movies, <laughs> even though I was only there for a couple of days. And uh, I'm not going to talk about. Uh, all of them but I will say one um, the very first thing that I watched when I went there which was kind of an unexpectedly delightful surprise is I signed up to see a bunch of short films uh, that were going to be playing the theme of these short films was digital closeness and I believe it was five in total and it was shown at just a small theater maybe 50 person theater or so Um, the room was packed out most of the People in the audience seemed to be the filmmakers themselves or people who knew the filmmakers because there was a lot of energy and a lot of cheering. And it was amazing. I I love watching short films and I, I don't do it nearly enough. And so to see five short films from these rising um, filmmakers who had, they're just, you know, they're bonded by the common theme of digital closeness, but telling very different stories from very different viewpoints. Um it was just really, really cool to see. And then at the end, there was a Q&A where some of the filmmakers got up and um, the audience got to ask them questions and hear a little bit more about what inspired their stories and where they are in their filmmaking journeys, because some of them are just starting out and some of them have been in the industry for a long time. And yeah, it was amazing. So I thought it was a great experience. And again, I just highly recommend if you've never been to a film festival and if you ever have the means and opportunity to go, even if it's just for a day, I would really recommend it because there's there's really nothing like being able to be in a town where all these other people are gathered who also love movies or are actively creating movies, getting to see movies in an audience where you know that some of the filmmakers are there and are going to be able to a- answer questions and are experiencing the movie with the crowd. It's just it's just such a cool feeling. So, yeah. Film festival. Yeah. Love them. Sounds really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, And all right. What about you, Tatum? What have you seen? (laughs) What have you seen this week? Wow. That was a lot briefer than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Um, Well, a lot of the things, too, that I I saw are probably not going to come out for a very long time because they're doing the festival circuit right now. So I mm -hmm. figured maybe some of them will come up in conversations in the future. But um, yeah, for now, I don't want to go too in detail with each of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad you had that experience. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so as far as what I've been watching, I haven't been watching too much, to be honest. Um, but I did go see a movie in theaters, which I feel like by the time this episode comes out, it I'm almost positive it won't be in theaters anymore because it's a small little indie film from A24. Um, but I would highly recommend seeing it when it comes out on video on demand or DVD or however you watch your your stuff. Um, but it's a little indie called Past Lives. Um, 
it's a movie that I have been waiting to see for uh, quite some time. It has not yet come out where I am, so ah, hopefully yeah. that happens pretty soon. Yeah, but. it it is a incredibly, incredibly beautiful film in terms of just the storyline and uh, just the themes that it's meditating on. So the basic premise of it is, so the movie starts with this woman, uh, well, she's a girl in the beginning. She's like eight or something like that. Maybe she's older than that. I don't know. I can't tell age of children. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm like, you're either older than five or you're less than 15. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but she, um, so she's a young girl in Korea and she has this boy that she's really good friends with, a childhood friend. But her family ends up picking up and very suddenly immigrating to, uh, I think, first to Canada and then to America afterwards. Um, and so she ends up living the rest of her like child and then into adult life in the U S and, um, her friend that she's left behind, he stays in Korea. And so the two of them kind of lose touch for 12 years and then they reconnect at 12 years after she's moved and she's in college. They're both in college and uh, Facebook is like a thing. And so that's how they discovered each other through Facebook. And so well, I don't want to like tell the story of the whole film because you should experience <laughs> it for yourself. But basically the whole concept, the reason why the movie is called Past Lives is because the movie explains that there's this concept in Korea called, I forget what it's called. It's like in, in yun or, or something like that, mm. which basically means that anyone that you meet in your life now, you've had, you've, you've encountered them in previous past lives many times, depending on how close your relationship oh, is with them in this life. And so the fact that this this man and this woman or this boy and this girl kind of keep bumping into each other as they grow older, it's kind of this concept of like, you know, did we know each other in past lives and what did that look like? Um, and so kind of like they're living on different sides of the world, but they still have this connection, but it's like weird because things happen and yada, yada, yada. So it's a really, really beautiful meditation on just like human connection and also immigration and what it's like to be an immigrant and a first generation immigrant. Um, and you know, just, just a lot of beautiful, beautiful storylines that I think are, are relevant for lots of people. Um, so yeah, I would highly recommend it. It's, it's a beautiful film. It's not overly long, which is great. Um, but yeah, if you like watching movies that are just kind of slow meditations on, human experiences uh I would this is the movie for you and even if that's not the type oh yes (laughs) and even if that's not the typical genre that you gravitate towards I would still give it a shot because it's it's very moving and uh I was watching it and I was like this feels very much so like a like a Wong Kar Wai type of vibe of a film if anyone knows who Wong Kar Wai is but um he kind of makes these tragic love stories that are like maybe not tragic but kind of basically tragic but beautiful but you know um so it felt very inspired by that um and so yeah it was just really beautifully made and well acted and and I think it was a directorial debut from Celine Strong that's the name of the director um and I think she's a Korean American um but yeah highly recommend it probably won't be in theaters anymore by the time this episode comes out but check it out when it comes to video on demand or however else you watch things so yeah that's pretty much all I've watched (laughs) um but it was great I absolutely loved it 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 was I hadn't seen uh uh, like an indie film for Tatum in a theater (laughs) in a while so it was nice to have that experience again Mm -hmm. so yeah um but anyway so that's what we've been watching uh so I will go ahead and move us forward into uh what specific film we're going to talk about today yeah so today on the show we are discussing Stanley Kubrick's 1964 satirical masterpiece Dr. Strangelove (laughs) how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb Loosely based on the book Red Alert, written by Peter George, the movie screenplay, co-written by Kubrick and author Terry Southern, walks the brilliant line of evoking both unease and genuine laughter. Written just a few years after the height of the Cold War, Dr. Strangelove is a funny yet frustrating and horrifying reflection on the concept of war and how it can escalate to incomprehensible, even ridiculous heights with catastrophic consequences. 
The movie tells the story of a world that is under threat of global annihilation after an American military general decides to initiate an FGD-135 wing attack, Plan (laughs) R. In other words, a large-scale nuclear attack on Russia. Taking place in primarily three locations, the remainder of the film shows how those who may have the power to stop the attack respond to the situation at hand. The pilots of one of the planes destined to drop one of the bombs, global politicians who sit in a room strategizing how to proceed, and the general who initiated the plan R attack in the first place. With very little time to make decisions, they all spend the fleeting moments that they have left doing the thing they know how to do best. Nothing. So Geneva, I know that you've seen this movie before, um, but can you just share with us your feelings watching it the second time around and also just your relationship with the movie in general? Yes. So I only saw this movie for the first time last year. Um, Fun (laughs) fact, I first saw it around April of last year, which was around the time that Russia invaded the Ukraine and the Cold War tensions between the United States and Russia were suddenly on the top of everyone's mind all over again. Uh, which is quite an uh, interesting experience and context <laughs> in which to see this. Um, but yeah, so I was excited to to rewatch it. This movie is, obviously, it is brilliant. It is so influential. Um, it's so dark, but so sharply pointed and so funny, and the performances are so good. I do find it to be such a strange movie in, like, it's just for a comedy it takes such a long time to really start dipping into the absurdity. They really play it straight from the beginning, which is part of what makes the comedy so effective is the fact that so many of the characters within it don't realize they're in a comedy. They are completely playing it straight as if this is a, you know, just a your average um, Cold War era military thriller or something like this. Um, I do find it to be just by modern standards and, you know, me as the person who loves old movies saying my modern standards, but it is paced very strangely given, you know, in, in contrast to what we would expect from a, um, a more modern movie, which I always find a little bit strange. And, you know, when I rewatch it, um, I don't want to say alienating, but it is a little bit strange just because there there can be kind of abju- abrupt cuts from one scene to another or um, the pacing is just a little bit slower than you might come to expect. But again, I mean, this movie is just, it's brilliant. You know, it's a it, it's an all-timer. It uh, somehow manages to be so, um, so detailed in the way that it depicts I I don't know what Stanley Kubrick or the writers of this film did in terms of research, but the way that they spend so much time kind of lovingly going into all the details of how, um, you know, American military uh, procedure and etiquette would be set up and all the things that the bombers need to go through in terms of decoding and checking all their switches and um, calling in and translating the codes in order to turn them into attack plans and things like that it just it all seems so real and that makes it all the more absurd when all of these things start to escalate and um george c scott starts doing somersaults in the middle of the room and all of a sudden peter sellers is a nazi um scientist and just like everything he's not a nazi he's not a nazi (laughs) what are you talking about (laughs) and it just keeps building and building and um yeah, so this movie is just it's it it is weird to watch it if I, I I'm not using a a great phrase to describe it. It's just it definitely doesn't have the sort of um smoothness and the 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 type of pacing and and humor and style that we would expect from a contemporary comedy, but it is just so interestingly done that I mean that you know, that's in no way a flaw on it because it is it's just a brilliant film that's really stood the test of time. Yeah. Okay. I have a very direct response to that, but before I get to that, I'll just share my general, um, just opinions on this film. So I, um, I've said this before on the podcast. It's no secret. Stanley Kubrick is my favorite filmmaker of all time. Um, he has been incredibly inspiring to me and, uh, you know, 90% of what he's made, are just like 
some of the best movies of all time that I've ever seen. You know, I just, I love Stanley Kubrick. Um, but I actually didn't really get into Stanley Kubrick until, I don't know, probably about four or five years ago. Um, because the only movie of his that I'd seen was 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, but I don't remember what kind of triggered it, but a few years back I was like, I'm just going to do a Stanley Kubrick binge and watch everything he's made. Um, and this movie, it just, it blew me away because seeing Stanley Kubrick do a comedy was just something that I did not expect. Um, it's definitely not a straightforward comedy in my opinion. Like it's definitely, definitely still got the, the drama and the intensity, you know, which Stanley Kubrick has in, in a fair amount of his films. Um, but yeah, I was just completely taken aback by how expertly this movie navigates the concept of nuclear war and just war in general and politics. And I feel like this movie is incredibly daring. I feel like for the time, the fact that I think it was Columbia Pictures, but the fact that a studio gave money to produce this film during this time is just, it's very risky. And I think that it was really, he took a chance on this and I think it paid off. This movie is very powerful and it has stood the test of time. I mean, it's, it's a film that, um, that is still relevant today, unfortunately, um, and probably will be relevant for years to come, unfortunately. Um, but I think that's just a testament to how fantastic this movie is and, and how well written, how well made it is. Um, so, yeah, I love this film uh, in terms of like my Stanley Kubrick ranking. It's probably my number three out of all the films he's made, uh, which I mean, this movie and, and Paths of Glory are really a close second and third, though. They could flip any any day of the week. Um, but yeah, I love this film. I think it's brilliant and it blows me away because I feel like this film, there's so much going on because there's so much talking in this movie that I feel like there's so much that you, I feel like this movie is so rewatchable because I feel like each time you watch it, you'll pick up on something different because there's just so much going on and it comes and it goes so quickly because then we move on to something else and, you know, or someone cracks a joke and then it's like, wait, what? Um, but yeah, so those are kind yeah. of... Oh, I wonder, if, sorry, <laughs> sorry to interrupt, but I was just thinking while you were talking, I feel like one of the things that sort of, I, not alienates me, but kind of throws me off when I watch it is that in some ways the humor is kind of a predecessor to something like Airplane, you know, what the Zucker brothers were doing, where there's a lot of quick sort of visual gags and verbal gags in terms of characters' names and things like that. But the style of humor is actually not very much not that. And the, definitely the pacing is is not that. This is a movie that has a very strong satirical point, whereas a movie like Airplane, it's its primary point is let's cram as many gags as we can <laughs> into each, <laughs> each minute of screen time. Airplane is and a very <laughs> serious movie, Geneva. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> what I'm talking about. <laughs> Um, we should talk about airplane on this podcast I at some point. Love I, I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, that those are the types of comedy movies that I grew up on. I love those movies. We should definitely do some. Um, but yeah, so just every now and then there would be like, I mean, there, there's some ridiculous names in this movie that oh, yeah. are cracking me up. I mean, the, the fact that the general who causes everything is called Jack Ripper. Like, mm -hmm. come on. You're like... Yeah, General Turgidson, like, what, what kind of a name? What's the president's name? Like, Martin Miffley or something like that? I don't even remember. They're, yeah, yeah, they're just, they're just so ridiculous. Um, so yeah. I think I, I just keep thinking of that and then expecting it to be that, and then it's it's not. It's something very different. Um, yeah. But anyway. Yeah, so kind of getting back to your initial, or one of your initial things that you said and, like, my direct response to that, Mm -hmm. I find it really interesting that for you, the pacing of this movie, it sounds like kind of pulls you out of it a little bit because for me, I love the pacing of this movie because I feel like for me, this movie is not, if I had to, you know, break it up into a, into a percentage of what percentage of it is comedy versus what percentage of it is drama, I would probably say that this movie is like 40% comedy and 60% drama. I see mm -hmm. this way more oh, yeah. as a drama than as a comedy. And if I think, more. but also, I don't, I don't know. They just go so well together. But I feel like for me, the pacing, because I do agree with you, the opening part is kind of, it doesn't lean as much into the humor. 
But I love that because I think the fact that it, it takes so long to get mm-hmm. to the parts that are really humorous in and of itself is humor in a twisted sort of way. Because for me, I was watching it and I just kept thinking, oh my gosh, the fact that this is... <clears throat> The fact that this is a legitimate threat that we've been aware of from the first, you know, two minutes of this movie, but we're taking so long to get to a point where people are actually taking it seriously and sitting in a room and trying to come up with some sort of decision of how to navigate this. I was like, I think this in and of itself is an intentional joke of we know that this is a serious threat, but let's take a really long time before we start (laughs) having conversations about oh, wait a minute, should we actually do something to stop this? Or do we even know that this is happening? Like, we don't know. And we have all these moments of, um, you know, of, uh, what's his name? Of of Turgidson, the first time we see him, of someone trying to get a hold of him. And he's like, nah, tell him to call back later. I don't (laughs) want to talk to him. Incredibly long scene of him coming up with every excuse of the son to not talk to his boss. (laughs) And so I think, at least for me personally, My favorite moments in this movie are the ones that take place in kind of that round room. I love everything that Mm -hmm. happens in there. But the fact that it takes so long for us to get to that point, I just, I love that, that pacing choice of kind of, okay, when are we going to actually start moving forward with this? You know, we've been seeing them talk about, they've been planning this like, you know, what is it? Attack R for a long time in this plane Mm -hmm. and where are we going and what blah, um, but anyway, yeah, I, I actually quite love the pacing of this movie. I think it takes a little bit to get going, but I think that's on purpose. And then yeah. once it gets going, it is just really fast. And I like how it abruptly cuts from one place to another because I feel like there's moments in the movie where it says, you know, we've got 20 minutes. And then they have a conversation. They're like, actually, it's 18 minutes now. And it's like, okay, but this movie is an hour and a half long. So how are we going to break up that time? And so like... I think that it's just, you know, it does end up becoming more than 18 minutes. I think it then extends to an hour or whatever. But I like, I like how it plays with time in that way to kind of make it feel like not as much time is passing as we think, but we're, we're seeing how this time is passed in different spaces. Um, But yeah, anyway, I, I really like the pacing of this movie and it, it, it pulls me in more rather than taking me out of it. Um, So yeah, to be clear, my, I didn't mean that in any way as a criticism. It was more, yeah, yeah. I the first time I had seen it, I was surprised by how long it took to start really bringing in the comedy elements. And then when I was watching it yesterday, again, in the midst of a film festival where I had three <laughs> other movies that I was seeing that day, I think I was a little bit, just a little bit tired and a little bit, all right, let's, you know, let's, let's, let's move it along. Like um, uh, Miney Python, move on with it, get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> But again, that's that's completely me. That's not an actual criticism of the movie. Because yeah. it does it does do such a good job then of building the suspense when in later scenes, you know, there's like all this crazy zany manic stuff happening in the war room or um in the on the base where uh, Mandrake and um Ripper are getting shot out and then it'll cut to the bomber where they're doing these highly intricate maneuvers and they're just going like all right now we're going to go through our uh, escape packs and like go mm-hmm. through every single item there and now we're going to go through and check these circuits and it's just very deliberate and mm-hmm. you know that like you know you're you're waiting for them to finally solve this problem or mm-hmm. you know for something for some sort of resolution and it just it keeps denying it to you and it just mm-hmm. builds builds the suspense more and more yeah, so, I mean, it, it very much is a deliberate choice. Um, just yeah. maybe not the greatest watching in the middle of a film festival is probably <laughs> not the greatest context in which to yeah. experience it. <clears throat> yeah, I get that. I feel like everything that you just said kind of explains why, you know, the last sentence of the opening description of the film, why I chose it to be phrased that way. We have very, with very little time to make decisions, they all spend the last fleeting moments that they have doing what they know how to do best. Nothing. Because I feel like they're all they're all doing Mm -hmm. things, but at like they're actually not doing anything. (laughs) Well, the funny thing is, is like rewatching it. I was like, one of the things I actually do really like about this movie, and in contrast to, so a movie that came out the same year that I watched it, which is Don't Look Up, which is very much trying to be a movie in the style of Doctor Strangelove, to be that sort of comedic satire of a important, relevant political topic. 
I think is far less successful than Dr. Strangelove. But one thing that I think that Dr. Strangelove does a much better job at specifically is that it has a very good handle on who are the competent characters and who are the crazy characters and actually having the competent characters make good decisions that make sense but be thwarted by outside forces basically whereas I think Don't Look Up leans too hard on every single character is crazy in some way except for maybe the lead two scientists but like I it is funny seeing you know General or uh, President Miffley I think his name is the president whoever whatever his name is just call him Peter Sellers (laughs) yeah (laughs) President Peter Sellers every decision that he makes is actually a very mind fear (laughs) (laughs) not gonna call him that Uh, every decision that he makes it I think is a very rational one and makes complete sense and probably should have worked it's just that there are larger circumstances at play involving incompetence from many different quarters that just combine to absolutely thwart every attempt to resolve the situation and end up with world annihilation but there are steps he makes where you're like oh no that's yeah that's a really good choice he he seems like he knows what he's doing it's just that he's hampered by all of these layers of bureaucracy and all these people working at cross purposes that just all ends up in disaster. Well, I also think along those lines, you know, I do think that the president, he he seems to be relatively smart or at least smarter than other people in the room. (laughs) Um, But at the same time, I do think that, you know, he, he's wanting to make good decisions and I think he has good ideas, but at the same time, he takes forever to get to the (laughs) point, you know, because Uh theoretically you know it's stated throughout the movie that there's nothing we can do to stop anything (laughs) but like theoretically if there was you the fact that he doesn't really feel a sense of urgency is 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 ridiculous to me but I think it's intentional you know because he kind of just he has these back and forth conversations with Turgidson over and over again where it's like I asked you to call me well I didn't call you why didn't you call me well because this okay well what time is it now oh it's this you know it's just this really long back and forth where I'm it's just kind of I'm just thinking cut to the chase man what like this is a serious (laughs) issue just ask the question or say the thing or make the decision and so I feel like even the most even the most um, uh, intelligent people in this movie, I think are still, they're still not the best. And I was thinking about even just kind of the, the people in the, in the jet, like, you know, the, the, what do you call them? The, the air fighters or I, I don't know, the, the military people that, <laughs> um, <laughs> the military people that are in the jet, you know, they, they are kind of competent to a certain extent, but at the same time, they're not really thinking for themselves, I feel like, in a lot of ways, because it's kind of like, oh, we were told to do this thing. And so, well, yeah, well, they're, we're they're... running out of oil. Uh, so let's, uh, like, <laughs> I don't know. We'll just keep going that way, I guess. <laughs> well, this is like the what the amazing satires pointed at is like, there are so many people in this movie who are competent and who are doing their jobs under less than ideal circumstances and who are problem solving and figuring it out. It's just that because of the ridiculous way that the system is set up and all these layers of bureaucracy and all these mm-hmm. impenetrable, yeah. you know, layers of military code and it's just the system has created it so that once this ball has been put into motion no one can stop it and so the entire movie these fighter pilot people think that they are the heroes of the story where it's like you know no, our country needs us to do out live yeah. our country needs us to carry out this mission and uh we're facing so many obstacles and we've got hit by bullets and so we need to um go to a closer target and we need to rewire the door so that we can do it and it's just all for nothing because it yeah is not a mission that actually needed to be carried out and in fact brings on the end of the world and also with the president too you know i think you know like we're both saying he is he is more intelligent than other people that are around but we also learned that he signed into law all of these policies and clearly (laughs) didn't read the fine print. You know, there's all these things where he's like, how could this happen? And, and they're like, dude, you were given, like you approved this, you know? And he's like, Oh, uh, (laughs) you know? So it's just like, there's, there's so many situations where I think, you know, that's, this movie is just so brilliant because everyone, in my opinion, everyone is an idiot. 
but in very different ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just think it makes this very interesting, this very interesting statement that I'm not saying is, is accurate. Uh, but I think it makes this interesting statement that like so many people that have so much power to do so much damage Mm -hmm. are not actually maybe the best people to be making those decisions um, or at least the way in which they're able to make those decisions needs to be modified in a different way. Um, but yeah, I just, I love that kind of being the the core statement of this film. I see a lot of, I mean, they're very, very different because one is <laughs> a lot more directly a comedy than this movie is, but I see a lot of similarities between this movie and Veep, for example. I think mm-hmm. Veep is a very another good example of just kind of showing the absurdity of how there are politicians that exist that are stupid, but it doesn't matter. Like they still stay in power and they still have enormous power to make decisions that impact everyone in very serious ways. Um, But yeah, I don't know. I just think that this movie navigates that in a way that somehow walks this line of being neutral in terms of what like, it definitely makes it definitely makes an anti-war statement and is definitely criticizing politics in certain ways, but it's not picking a side in terms of these specific politician, politicians or this specific whatever. And I think that that's really brilliant because I think nowadays if someone were to make this movie, it would be, okay, we're criticizing the Democrats or we're criticizing the Republicans or we're it's and this is just like no, we're criticizing humanity, you know? And I think that that's really well done. Yeah, I agree with you. Although I think, I I feel like my interpretation of the movie is slightly different in that I see it as a movie where almost everyone is to some degree competent and is just trying their best. And it is the system and also the military specifically, or at least the, the higher up generals in the military chain who are the source of the problem. Because it's basically everyone is competent and is genuinely rational and trying their best, with the exception of uh, General Ripper, who's just crazy, (laughs) and then General Turgidson, who is just, you know, he's not crazy, but he is some sort of, like, trigger-happy weirdo, (laughs) (laughs) who does not seems to be perfectly happy with like, oh, well, you know, oopsies, let's just, we're going to start a war, let's go ahead and start it, like, better now than uh, later. I mean, I feel like we see, I feel like we see, um, you know, issues with um, the Nazi guy, too. Like, I don't think he's really necessarily the most intelligent per- I think he's kind of wacky and, and weird. And I also think well, that he's just, I mean, like the, he's a Nazi. Oh, it, yes. Um, and then I think the captain or I, I don't know military terms. So I apologize to anyone who's in the military listening to this. Like, <laughs> I don't know rankings or titles. Um, but the, the captain of the, the plane or whoever, I don't know what his title is. You know, when they drop the bomb, he's sitting on it and he's yeah. like <laughs> screaming yeehaw as if, you know, this is just the coolest thing to ever happen to him. Mm-hmm. And he was the one who was in charge of the plane. So I don't know. I, I definitely see a lot more incompetent people than competent people here. Well, the I don't think the pilot's incompetent because he gets the job done. <laughs> it's just that he's I don't a know. weird... Um, like I guess it depends. How do Texan we define incompetence? But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the... Um, I mean, the the Nazi scientist, I mean, he's very much this sort of idea of American military and political policy being very willing to harness Nazi scientists post-war in order to fulfill their own purposes. And so it's kind of this idea of the the dark underbelly of American post-war policy being the, the resources that they were able to garner from Nazi Germany. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And again, I don't think he's incompetent. It's kind of terrifying how competent he was. Yeah. I, and I also think that the the leader of Russia, too, like he he or she, whoever they are. Dimitri. Like they're not. Uh, they're oh, yeah. not well, really he's very like he's out partying. He is, he's wasted the entire movie. Yeah. And so they're trying to reason with him. And he's just like. Oh, man. Their yeah. phone call, the phone call between the two of them is probably, I think they have two phone calls in this movie, but mm-hmm. those are my favorite moments in this whole film, which is why, you know, they're on the the movie, like the movie poster for this film, because they're so, 
they so well define kind of what this movie is and and where it's going and what it centers on um but yeah I actually just kind of saying that or bringing that up I want to that just makes me think about like if you have any thoughts on it I would love to talk a little bit about um what the what your thoughts on the poster for this movie uh, honestly, I'd never really looked hard at that poster before, but I'm just now noticing that the um, it's pretty great. The Russian premiere has like a woman's hand with a martini glass draped mm-hmm. over his shoulder, which is yep. pretty funny. Um, yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just I love I love the colors. I love how it's red, white, and blue, and it's got all of these planes. And because mm-hmm. even just the plan of the movie itself, because obviously we all know, especially in 1964, people definitely all knew, we know the destruction of an atomic bomb. And the fact that we see on this big board that Turgidson always talks about, he's like, look at the board. Oh my gosh. I mean, they have hundreds of planes flying in with all of these weapons. And I'm like, I think that's enough to destroy the world like 50 times over. (laughs) <laughs> um, which is just absolutely insane. And then you see that Russia's responding with like the same amount. I'm like, this is nuts. Um, but anyway, yeah, I just think this poster is brilliant how it's got these two leaders who just are like trying to talk to each other, but they're separated by mm-hmm. a ridiculous amount of planes that are flying over this world that they're like going to bomb and destroy. Yeah. And um, the graphic style is consistent too with them. Um, I've always loved the graphic style of the opening credits, how it's that sort of large kind of childish block lettering which Mm -hmm. actually seems kind of very modern in some ways but is also um I feel like I I see a lot of it in throughout the 60s but um I don't know if that's intentional that it looks very to me childish but I think it it does a great job of setting up this idea that you know the, the entire world is at the mercy of a bunch of children who um, are just trying to figure things out and don't really know what they're doing and a couple of small mistakes can have these huge ramifications yeah it reminds me of like a like a newspaper cartoon or something Mm. um so I wanted to ask kind of I guess going a little bit more into just themes and and what they mean to you or how you interpret them how do you interpret the fact that pretty much every single time we have scenes in this aircraft that this these military people are flying mm. in. We hear the ants go marching in the background. Did did that did that mean anything to you? Um, I didn't even consciously notice it at the time. But um, I mean that's kind of a classic military song, right? Like a, a classic, you know, something that you might sing while you're marching or something like that. So I think it's just kind of giving this idea that these are the people who are the representatives of the, um the active military and this is their whole life and this is you know they train their entire their entire purpose and existence is to carry be carrying out these orders and that is their primary function in this film but also in their um career and so I don't know that's just kind of the the feeling that it left me that these are um just so much representatives of yeah, military people carrying out their orders. So I I could be wrong, but mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that this song does it's not a military song. I think it's like a like a kids well like it's a, a kids th- children's song. Well it's da 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 right? Or mm-hmm. am I thinking of it? Yeah, yeah. Because that's uh, when Johnny comes marching home again, which is a military. It's a, I think a civil war song. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The lyrics are different, though. Okay, so that actually adds a lot more. Oh, man, that actually makes that that song choice a lot more interesting to me. Because, I I mean, I already thought it was interesting, but now I think it's even more interesting because I didn't know about the song that you just said, the the Civil War version. But the lyrics are different. And so I think it's really interesting kind of playing with that duality of, you know, these people are on the one hand, you know, they're, they're proud military men who are, you know, they're fighting for their cause that they believe in. And I don't know whether the, um, the union or the Confederates were singing this, um, (laughs) but I think if the Confederates were singing it, that makes an even stronger statement about what is going on here. Um, but also the fact that this song also has a, a double meaning of just being a kid's song 
where kids are singing that the ants are going into the ground to get out of the rain. Boom, 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 boom. You know, (laughs) it's just, I think, I just think that's really interesting, especially since you were saying before how, you know, in, in certain ways, these people are kind of like kids that have power. But I just think it's interesting how, at least my initial interpretation, thinking that this was drawing directly from the children's song and exclusively from the children's song, Mm -hmm. was that, you know, these are just a bunch of people that are just doing their thing and not really thinking about it at all. The association with the ants go marching, like the idea of worker ants who are just kind of their whole existence is around fulfilling their function and they're they're not, you know, thinking in any grander or more strategic way about what they're doing. Yeah, so they're kind of just, I don't know, I feel like they're kind of just guys who are, unless given orders, they're kind of just going to be hanging out and playing around and they don't really know what to do with themselves until they're told what to do and then they're like, oh, okay, I'll do the thing. And I'm not saying that that's how military people are, but I'm saying I think that that's how they're portrayed in this movie and the fact Mm -hmm. that... You know, the opening sequence we have of them is someone reading Playboy and someone taking a nap and another person, (laughs) you know, dealing cards. And, you know, it's just and they're in these planes that are carrying these like incredibly destructive (laughs) weapons. And they're just like, oh, yeah, we'll just hang out. The the captain who's flying the plane is sleeping while he's sitting in his chair, (laughs) you know. And so I just thought it was interesting how we have these characters who have all of this power, like we've been saying, you know, um, but they're kind of just, unless they're directly told what to do and they just mindlessly follow it, they're kind of just these, these robots who exist to execute a plan. Um, And so I just thought that was, I thought that was interesting. The fact that I think that that theme is really, really hammered into us because every single time we have a scene at the Mm -hmm. plane, that song is playing throughout that entire sequence over and over and over again. Yeah. So Well, and like so many of the conflicts are caused by people just doing, it's specifically within the military because that's the, the context of this movie, doing the job that they've been assigned to do and following the, the orders they've received or following the procedure that has been set up. Um, but it ends up causing all of these conflicts because of this situation that they couldn't have foreseen. Like the... Um, I mean, the fact that General Ripper orders the shutdown of the base, and so no one can get in. And so this entire shooting war erupts between different sides of American soldiers, where one side is so convinced, like, oh, they're actually commies in disguise, because that's what our general told us. Uh, and so they're just doing their jobs, and they're getting and killed. And all the radios and all mm-hmm. the phones, so no one can communicate. Yeah, or like that really hilariously absurd scene toward the end, where poor Poor uh, Captain Mandrake, or whatever his title is, or I can't remember what his rank is, but he he knows he has the key to to stop everything from happening, and he's just trying to get through to the president. And this one military guy is like, "No, no, no, I I can't let you do that. Like, I can't let you phone the president." And he's like, "No, please." And then he keeps he keeps blocking him. He keeps being like, "All right, if but I'm not going to give you any succeed, change. I'm not going to shoot will out have the Coca- to answer to Coca Cola if you." <laughs> it's such a good line. Yeah. 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 I, I also think, uh, one of my favorite concepts in this, I mean, there's so many concepts in this movie that, you know, this movie is, is funny and it's horrifying, but I think part of the reason why it is as funny and as horrifying as it is, is because of the parallels that we can draw to the world that we actually live in. And I, I found it to be incredibly fascinating of a choice for this story that all of it starts because of this one guy who has a conspiracy theory mm-hmm. about liquids within our own bodies <laughs> and no one knows what the crap he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. No one understands. And even when he's explaining it to like patient little old Peter Sellers, you know, yeah, he's like, no uh-huh, choice. <laughs> sure. Okay. That's great. Um, but I love that concept of, you know, if you, Ideas can be dangerous. And I think Mm -hmm. that that was true back then. And I think it's very true now, you know, and we see a lot of that happening in our day and age, you know, people get freaked out about certain things, whatever it might be. And then they start concocting these stories into the biggest threat to ever exist. And it's like, well, thankfully, you know, a fair amount of those people are not in power, but if they were, you know, what would, what would that mean? And, um, and, are they getting more power and could they get to that place and how close are, 
you know, how many people do we have already in the government that have those mentalities but are covering it up, you know? Um, so I just thought that it was a really, really brilliant choice that this movie, you know, this whole attack didn't start because someone perceived a legitimate sort of threat from Russia. It was just based off of some sort of conspiracy theory that they had in their mind that they somehow attached to Russia. So I guess like I could follow up by asking you, you know, do you have any thoughts in terms of the choice of having the person who started this whole thing, have it be based off of a conspiracy (laughs) theory as opposed to any sort of, you know, evidence that we should actually attack, (laughs) attack (laughs) Russia. Do you have any thoughts on that in terms of within the story itself and implications on the society that we live in today or anything like that sure yeah well oh boy (laughs) watching this in 2023 I mean I I don't want to get too far into the weeds in this but yeah especially conspiracy theory politically neutral everybody (laughs) conspiracy theory specifically surrounding um issues of public health and the attempt to better the the pub the general welfare and health of a society yeah, uh, yeah. There's there's some relevance there. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, you know, I, I I definitely agree with everything that you said. It's it's just so, um, so terrifying, but so well done. This idea that it's just one person who's kind of gone off the rails who ends up sparking all of this. Just a word too for the performance of I think it's Sterling Hayden who plays General yeah. Turgidson because he does such a good job of s- just having that sort of, you know, stolid um sort of brusque military demeanor that you've seen in a, you know, a thousand military movies made in the 40s, 50s, 60s. I know he was a guy who did a lot of like film noir and things like that. And, you know, he just seems like your average male from the 1960s who's older and he's a military guy and he's just brusque and he gives, you know, he gives orders and everything like that. And slowly over the course of the film, you just start to see how crazy he is. Oh, you're actually nuts. <laughs> oh, like, oh, yeah. And it's like everything he's saying, you're like, wait, that, but that's crazy. But coming out of coming out of your mouth, like it sounds like it shouldn't be, but it is. Yep. And um, yeah, he just does such a great job with the slow reveal of just how nuts General Turgidson is. Um, you know, we're kind of seeing it as um, Peter Sellers as uh, Mandrake is seeing it, and it's just yeah, it's it's such a great sort of unraveling, and the way that the um, the scenes, there's a couple of specific shots of him too, where it's kind of a close up on his face and the shadows falling across it. And he's chomping on this big cigar. So he's giving these long monologues that are just completely unhinged. And it's just absolutely so terrifying. hard to follow. I, I, I actually rewatched a few of them. Like I rewound. Cause I was like, is there something here that I'm not getting? Like, I want to make sure I'm actually understanding what he's saying. And I was like, Oh, Okay, this is just crazy. (laughs) The part where he's like, women, I don't avoid women. Women are attracted to me because of my power, but I I deny them my life essence. And you're like, okay, I'm sorry, what? (laughs) Yeah, and he, you know, I love how in the beginning, I think it's one of our first interactions with him. He actually tells Mandrake or asks him, he says, you know, bring me some some water but it needs to be the the rain water or whatever mm-hmm. and but at that point a in green time, alcohol and rain water right but at that point in time he seems to be a very like powerful you know mm-hmm. sergeant or whoever he is so it's kind of like okay that's a weird request but that's fine but then later on in the movie he's like do you know why i only drink rain water <laughs> and we're like um and then, and then and then mandrick is begrudgingly like uh no, I don't. And then he just, he goes in this crazy roundabout way. It takes him forever to get to the answer. He's like, did you know that you're made up of 70% water? Why do you think you're made up of 70% water? Well, the water, <laughs> it's just like, what? And then I just love this idea how I don't think anyone else knew how crazy he was either. And they're kind of learning as we're learning. Cause even that message that he sends like that last letter or transmission or whatever it is that he sends to that round room and Turgid sends reading it to everybody. And the last he's like, our liquids, our fluids, our fluids. We're still trying to figure out what that last yeah. line means. <laughs> yeah. Know? And that's before we've learned from General Turd. Or, exactly. Uh, from General Ripper, like what exactly what he means. And so it's just like this weird 
phrase put into his message that will just become clear later. Well, there's also this great moment in in the film, too, when Ripper is telling Mandrake about, you know, the threat of of the of all of those things. And I think he says something along the lines of um, our, you know, our liquids are are the biggest threat facing us today. And then immediately after he says that, all of this gunfire shoots through the window and like oh almost hits them, <laughs> but like it lands uh-huh. right next to them. And I just love that kind of that not that pacing because it's not pacing, but just like the how timing that, of it. yeah, the timing of that, how he says that. And then immediately mm-hmm. they literally almost die getting shot by the yeah. guns. It's like, okay, so our, our liquids are, are actually, the, yeah, the uh, liquids are the problem. That, sure. That's, that's the main threat here. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, I love the part where he's, um, they're getting shot at and he's moving around his office trying to, um, put together the gun, which was hidden in his golf club, and <laughs> pulling out the belt and everything. And it's just shots keep coming through the window and they just keep perfectly missing him. It's yep. pretty impressive. Yeah. He, you know, he just knows me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I found it was interesting, you know, that whole sequence where he's talking to he's talking to Mandrake, and he's kind of like, you know, have you ever been a, pis- a prisoner of war? And he's like, well, yes, yes, sir, I have. And then they go into this whole kind of deep ish conversation. Yeah. And then Ripper kind of reveals he's like, you know, if they, you know, I wouldn't last long. I would give them all of the answers if I were to get caught. And I'm kind of like what answers are they look because you initiated this so I don't really know like what answers they're gonna ask that you would I I don't know but the fact that that kind of leads to his end of him deciding you know well I'm just gonna kill myself because I'm not strong enough to withstand you know torture um I just thought that that was a very interesting end to this guy who man he's really got an arc you know he just starts somewhere and then goes somewhere else and then ends somewhere else (laughs) Yeah, I I believe what he's referring to is the key, um, the key code that would allow them to oh, talk to the right. bombers and recall yeah. the bombers. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the fact that he's willing to admit, like, you know, this big, tough military man with a, a long standing career, I don't know how I would stand up to torture and therefore I'm going to kill myself rather than have my scheme be foiled. Yeah. Um, yeah. Chilling. But Very also, chilling. I don't know how much his fellow military men would be torturing him to get for i mean maybe they would i don't well, know I mean, but the time is of the essence i <laughs> don't well, they, yeah, the, yeah i don't want to say that that would happen but you know we got to prevent the discre- destruction of the world in this instance like it might happen yeah which okay so let, let's get into a little bit how um it's so funny I, my brain's just like sporadically thinking of all these things in the moment um but let, let's talk a little bit, assuming you have any thoughts, but let's talk a little bit about how, you know, these two huge threats in terms of, you know, America flying in with these planes and then this, what is the Russian weapon called? Like the, the doomsday device the, yeah, or the, the doomsday, doomsday machine or the something. The doomsday machine, which is a absolutely absurd name for, for something well, like I'm, that. Well, what else are you going to call it? <laughs> it brings about doomsday. <laughs> but, but I love, I love the concept of both of these things being created but mm-hmm. they are created to not be stopped. And and they all thought this was a really good idea of, oh yeah, this is the smart and the safest and the wisest way to do this because we have to be able to create this thing and no one can stop it because if someone can stop it, then mm-hmm. anyone can stop it for the wrong reasons. And but I'm like, it should be the other way around. Like if anyone can initiate it, they could initiate it for the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah. But then the fact that the doomsday one, they can't even control how it gets started. It just like mm-hmm. analyzes the data of some sort of something else. And then it's like, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to activate now. And yeah well and the just the the absurd fact that all of this happens in the brief window of time in which the doomsday machine is online and active but no one yet knows about it because yeah. i mean i don't know if it actually would have stopped general ripper but he wasn't intending to activate the doomsday machine he just wanted to start nuclear war with russia but the russians have already put this thing online and they're like, oh, yeah, we were going to announce it at the party congress on Monday. <laughs> so it's not even yeah. working as a deterrent. It's just yes. sitting there waiting to be triggered. Yeah. I just love how we have these really long, elaborate dialogue moments of them just like explaining the extent to which they've gone to make sure mm-hmm. that these things cannot be stopped. 
script. Like there's this <laughs> back and forth between the president and Turgidson where he's like, he's just asking all of these questions and Turgidson, every single answer is like, nope, we can't do that. Well, why not? Well, because we knew that it would be good to do this. And like, okay, well, what about this? <laughs> nope, we can't do that. Well, why not? Because this person, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. you know, and every single answer is so dumb. And, it, and you can tell the president is kind of like, with each question he asks, he's just thinking, why, why, why? And then he finally <laughs> asks why. And they're like, well, you approved it. So, I, you know, what do you yeah. want from us? <laughs> but yeah, I just love the, the extent to which they've gotten to, to make it impossible to stop this, mm-hmm. this incredibly, you know, really terrible thing that they've yeah. created. But the idea with the Dr. Strangelove character, right, is that the, the Russia has the doomsday machine and the United States does not have one yet have one but they had been looking into one dr strange love had been leading a investigation to look into possibly creating one is that correct yes mm-hmm. okay but <laughs> yeah but instead he recommends that they all go down to a bunker and stay there oh for a hundred years and each man <laughs> gets 10 wives and they're all like that's kind of crazy until turgidson puts it together he's like so every man gets 10 women eh Hmm. Yeah, there might be great. something to this <laughs> yeah. and and then and then i think i think that dr strangelove says something along the lines of like yeah so the society the societal norm of monogamy at least for men anyway well yeah. no <laughs> needs exist. to be put away with for the good of the species and also for the good of the species these women women that we're going to select need to be uh, particularly sexually attractive and um you know for the good of the species and everything i i, I don't there it is wasn't it there like it sexually attractive but also like a high libido type of thing like they have mm-hmm. to really want to have sex a lot and the guys are like hmm. yeah young beautiful really eager yeah. to have sex and the fact that that is how this whole conversation and therefore the world ends of them just being like oh well we've determined that we can't solve this problem it's just going to happen so what do we do well let's protect ourselves by going down into a bunker what else should we do when we go down there? It's like as if you have time to do research to know, gather to all do of, any these of these women. Things. <laughs> like, you know, it's but like then it there's also that them, re- it would it would have taken them another two hours just to talk about how they would figure out how they're going <laughs> to yeah. do this. And by that you time, you don't it's have too time late. to actually. Yeah. No, but also there's that ridiculous um, monologue that Turgidson gives at the end, where he's like, you know, we're gonna, you know, when we we're gonna go down into our minds, and the Russians are gonna go down into their minds, and you know, we have to have a certain number of minds so that when we come up, there's no <laughs> mine shaft gap between the two of us. Oh my <laughs> it's just, gosh. it's the exact arguments that get made about building up nuclear weapons except it's about people hiding out in mine shafts for 100 years like rats this movie is just so it's so quick mm-hmm. you know every single line every single conversation it's so funny and so ridiculous but also so chilling at the same mm-hmm. time you know this movie is just i don't know how it does it it just it holds in the balance these two seemingly opposite emotions and concepts but they're both equally held and they, they interact so well together and so perfectly, which I think is why this movie is considered to be the masterpiece that it is because it's, I I don't understand how it came into being and how, you know, Kubrick and this crew, how they were able to pull it off and not be murdered for, you know, speaking out against something in a super offensive way. You know, it's just, it's so, it's, it's just crazy how it managed to navigate this incredibly personal and controversial sort of topic. Yeah. But also very... maintain neutrality in certain ways. Yeah. I would be very curious actually to know more about the context because I mean, these are conversations that were happening. I don't think it was particularly unusual for people to be critiquing um, governmental policy when it comes to nu- nuclear armament. Um just the the pointedness of this particular satire. I don't know if there's particular people who are being sort of caricatured in this movie, but yeah, I would be very curious to know more about the context and the controversy that this movie courted and the the criticism, but also the the reception from general audiences. I would be very curious. I mean, based off of the research that I did, it didn't seem to be negatively received by mm. By many people. But I think also like, yes, I I mean, obviously I am not an expert on this time. I was not alive then and I have not done extensive research on what life was like in 1963 and 64. But um, at the same time, I do feel like from what I 
the like what I do know about the atomic bomb. I feel like after it was dropped, pretty much the entire world recognized, oh, we should never do this ag- mm. again. Like this was really bad. And yet we continue to make these things. But whatever. Um but but beyond this movie criticizing just specifically um nuclear weapons, I think it's also just criticizing politics and government and politicians Mm. and war in general and so for me that's where I'm kind of thinking how did they get away with this because I feel like there's a lot of you know global leaders or politicians or you know generals or whoever that would be like this is incredibly you know I mean you know America has you know free speech blah 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 whatever but that doesn't necessarily mean that you won't upset people and so I just I can't believe that they were able to release this and not I don't know. I feel like if this were to be released today, there would be people, you know. I I, I don't necessarily agree with that because I think Don't Look Up is attempting okay, to be pointed sucks. in the same way. It that movie it does sucks. Suck. It does suck. It's I'm just awful. saying it's a similar type of pointed satire. I I guess my point is just I don't think there was ever any any danger that this movie would be shut down <laughs> by the powers that be at the time. Maybe if something, obviously not exactly the same but something similarly critical of um military strategy had been made during world war ii i could definitely see that um but But i I feel like if something like this were made today it would be it it would be very heavy it would be very controversial i feel like if there was a film made today that was satirically criticizing some sort of really relevant political thing that existed in this country Mm -hmm. there would be a strong reaction from at least half of the population saying, how could you do this? You're criticizing this thing that is a good thing or it's, or it's protecting us or it's doing this, that, or the other, like regardless of what side you're on, I feel like if something like this were made today with a mod, not that this isn't a relevant topic, but like with something that is very heated and relevant to this specific time, it, it would not have been like, oh, this is a great movie. We all love this movie, and it's one of the best films of all time. <laughs> you know, I feel like it would it would be met with a lot of, I don't like people would not be happy with it. And I'm not going to give specific examples because that's just dumb. Um, <laughs> but yeah, sure. Well, I mean, we just live in an er- area, an era where every single thing is met with discourse with a capital D. We live in a world where people are willing to start war because they're afraid of liquids I, like wh- whatever whatever the modern version of that <laughs> is mon- i think modern equivalent we, we live we have a there lot are many general turgences that live among us yes there are lots of people that have their own version of liquids as threats yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right we should um, probably get off this topic well i mean i'm trying to be neutral i'm not criticizing anyone specifically i'm just saying because i think there's people on all sides that have their own opinion. I have probably my own opinions that people would be like, Tatum, that's a liquid. And I'd be like, yeah, probably is. Thanks for telling me. Let me adjust to not think that way anymore. Um, but yeah, let's all, let's all look inward and check our own liquids. <laughs> check our fluids. Sure that, yeah. Check our fluids. Um, so can we talk about the, about Dr. Strange a little bit? Because mm. I find it interesting because so, this movie is called Dr. Strangelove. Yes. He is not really in this movie very much. Again, with and the like unexpected sort of pacing and structure of this movie is definitely not what you would, you know, not what a general Hollywood producer would look at this script and say, okay, first thing you need to actually introduce Dr. Strangelove in act one and have him be a presence throughout. And instead, Dr. Strangelove shows up at like the half hour or the the halfway p- mark of this movie and then just kind of has a couple couple little creepy monologues but i mean i can see why the movie was named after him cuz he's such an unsettling character and then the whole ending is kind of based around his breakdown but again it's just unconventional storytelling structure you know not not what the the screenwriting books tell you to do yeah so i was just going to ask because i don't I find it interesting that this movie is named after him. He doesn't come in until very late on. And then he's not really in it very much. And then also he's 
in a lot of the movie posters, it's kind of his face with like the camera from underneath and there's light on him and all these things. So I think that this movie, at least based off of how I'm perceiving it, this movie is making an argument that Dr. Strangelove is one of, if not the most important characters in this film. I don't understand that. That's never made sense to me. I don't really understand the relevance of him in this movie at all. Uh, not not that he's not relevant, but I don't understand why he's seen to be or seemingly presented to be at the core of this film. Because he, in my mind, he's just someone who comes in and offers some extra jokes towards the end. <laughs> and he's, you know, a, a Nazi guy that adds jokes. So I don't really understand. Maybe you can Maybe you can explain it to me if you have a better understanding of it. But I'm just kind of like, he comes in to make some jokes. And he's funny, but... And he's creepy. Yeah, I, I just, I don't understand the huge significance of, of him, but he seems to, he seems to be significant, but I'm just not getting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I cannot say that I can fully explain it because I had a lot of the same questions that you do, but to my interpretation of it would be that he is the character that best embodies the most pointed edge of the satire in the idea that at its heart, all of these, um, a lot of the sort of philosophies of um, self-protection at all costs, even the cost of the entire world, and we must have all the power, even if that leads to destruction of everybody, are fascist. And this idea that America has, um, in some sense, to a certain extent, sold its own soul by bringing on board this guy who is this like barely even attempting to pretend to be reformed Nazi. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. I'm sure he claimed not to be a Nazi when they brought him on board, but like he's he's barely pretending. They should have a better vetting system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like we don't have any of the Russians in the room who had created this doomsday device. We we just have the ambassador who's there who knows all about it. But it's the same philosophy, presumably, that led the Russians to create the doomsday device that led America to. I mean, we didn't haven't created it yet, but we're certainly thinking about it and exploring the possibility. And so he's kind of this living embodiment of this um, desire to just create the bigger and bigger stick, basically, until everyone in the entire world is potentially dead um, because of our own, yeah, desire to be the strongest and the most self-protected. And so I think even though plot wise, he doesn't have a huge point in the movie, I think he mainly serves as a more symbolic val um, uh, symbolic function within the film. Of just like watch for the threat of America becoming a, a Nazi nation because any nation could become a Nazi nation if they like aren't wise about how not, they... Not America becoming Nazi nation in the sense that America becoming fascist, but more just these impulses which are leading to the self-destruction of the entire world are mm -hmm. similar impulses which are found within the the fascist dictatorships i think which is which is funny because we have that that moment earlier in the film where um where the president is kind of talking about you know what decisions they can make and what are their options and then he says something well i think that it's churgidson who's like you know if we do this instead of that, we would kill 20, 20 million people. <laughs> yeah, that line is so good. He's like, 10, people. 20 million dead tops. <laughs> like, yeah. Depending on the breaks. <laughs> it's so yeah. funny. And then, and then the president responds with like, I will not be known mm -hmm. as the next Hitler or whatever, because mm -hmm. I'm not going to be a mass murderer of 20 million people. And then Turgis him responds with like, well, you should be more concerned with blah, 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 rather lives. than how you'll be remembered in the history mm -hmm. books. Well, very it's specifically, like, um, he's like, you should be more concerned with preserving American lives or um, like the future prosperity of America in, instead of, you know, being known as a mass murderer or something like that. Like it's uh, very, it's, it's, it's pointed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plus, I mean, just in addition to his symbolic value, Dr. Strangelove just has a great look that looks amazing on posters. Oh my gosh, like he's got the does. little little round dark glasses and the crazy hair. Yeah. Well, I actually, in the research that I did uh, before this podcast, I saw that, um, so Peter Sellers, apparently he saw, I don't remember who specifically it was, but maybe it was the um, the grips, but he saw someone like, wearing gloves on their hands because they were handling really hot lights on the set mm -hmm. and Peter Sellers was like 
that seems pretty cool. I should have a glove. Oh, nice. <laughs> and so like it was, it was his suggestion to have his character wear a glove because he thought it felt intimidating or mm -hmm. something like I that. I mean, they look very um, uh, Gestapo-esque. Or yeah. it, I mm -hmm. should say, because he's only wearing one glove. What do you think about the moment when, when the hand that he seemingly has no control of, it seems yeah. to be a being of its own. What do you think about when the hand starts choking him? Like it turns on him and starts choking. He's like, oh. I was very, I was confused about what exactly that was supposed to symbolize or mean. I mean, I think it's supposed to be just building up to the eventual him doing the, the Heil Hitler salute and this idea that his kind of latent impulses are coming out. And basically his arm is this, kind of primal part of him that's showing what's you know what's rolling around in his head what everything that he's trying hard to um mask and Surprise. pretend is not there yeah and it's just like mm -hmm. his arm is um showing the way the fact that at, at his deep dark core he just wants to like go nuts and kill everybody and salute the Fuhrer um oh. but yeah it was the ending to this movie is again you know it's unconventional by certainly modern comedy standpoint there's a lot of things that just happen and like mm -hmm. the the um the russian ambassador going and taking pictures of the board which mm -hmm. does not i mean it's set up a little bit before because they were worried about him doing that but there's no payoff for it because then the world ends and so i'm very curious about the the decision oh, to keep that in there i i love it I, I think that it I think that it creates this idea because I feel like Yeah, why do you me, think that's in if, there? If I was watching this movie for the first time Well I don't know. I was gonna say if I were watching this movie for the first time, I wouldn't expect the movie to end in the way that it did in terms of things exploding. I would have assumed, you know, maybe somehow the plane stops or runs out of fuel and lands in a field somewhere. You know, I don't know. And so I feel like the movie kind of holds that tension up to the very end of this story isn't over. Like these lives will go on. This political situation and this political um, like tension that is happening, like it will continue because this is how politics is. This is how the world is. This is how war works, you know, and it it holds that up to the very end of life will go on because that's how life is right mm -hmm. like if we had theoretically been in this room that thank god doesn't exist <laughs> at least not as far as we know <laughs> um but if i if we had been in that room during this moment this is what would have happened like the russian ambassador if he had intentions to do whatever with that information he would have been taking pictures of it to take mm -hmm. it back to wherever he was going so it's so like in the desperate hope that he'll actually be able to survive this he's just going to take these pictures just in case yeah like they're just living they're just living their lives in terms of like okay what's next what's next what's mm -hmm. next and then everything and they're, ends yeah like and i think that that kind of finalizes this idea of going back to the beginning of this movie is it takes a long time to finally get to the point of them sitting in the room and talking about things because their understanding of the urgency of the situation is just not as urgent as it actually is like mm -hmm. they always seem to think that maybe they have a little bit more time than they actually do <laughs> and they literally die and they're caught off guard how, i don't see how this is possible but they're caught off guard by the fact that they're all <laughs> blown up at the end well it cracks me so, up that we see you know we see the the people in the the guys in the bomb fight um the, the bombing plane they deliver the bomb slim pickens goes down riding it like he's in a rodeo <laughs> and then it cuts back to the war room and it's just like the president and General Turgidson, and I think there's someone else, and they're just like sitting on a bench together, and they kind of have their arms around each other. And General Turgidson's like, his his shirt sleeves are pulled up, and it's like they're all just chilling. They're just like waiting around to die, and kind of talking about possibilities in the meantime. They're all just like, all right, well, let's just kind of hang out and you know talk about maybe what we could do, but we know it's useless. I these these guys are just all nuts i i just i <laughs> they're think all they're nuts. all you know ripper is definitely the craziest but everyone else is not far behind <laughs> <laughs> i don't know they're just all a bunch of goons Ugh. but yeah i'm trying to think if there's anything like is there anything else in this movie that you particularly want to talk about any moments uh, well, or any we haven't talked like very much about specific performances about apart from oh sure um, sterling hayden but i mean yeah um, obviously peter sellers has three different roles in this movie which he does he's fine in this movie he's fine you know whatever <laughs> not iconic yeah. in the least um 
but yeah. I love Peter Sellers period. Like mm-hmm. I, I just, I love him as an actor and as a comedian. I think he's, he's amazing. Yeah. You know, I don't actually know how many other Peter Sellers movies I've seen. Cause I've never seen any of those original um, Pink Panther movies. <gasps> Geneva, we need to watch one of those. All right, I'd be very. I'm gonna happy find to. a streaming service and we can do a watch party because <gasps> those are, wow, yeah, they're good. At okay. least the first one's really good. Ooh, okay. And I, if I, I remember correctly, I think the second one's not bad either. How many but, yeah, did they we, make in all? Ooh, I don't know, mm. three maybe, but I don't remember. <clears throat> There's some like you know pink pink panther fan listening to this and just like raging that I don't know how many <laughs> yeah. they made. I, I genuinely don't, but I know yes. they made at least I two. I saw the the. Probably, I'm assuming, terrible reboot with Steve Martin um, years and years ago, whenever that came out. I don't remember that super well. Yeah. Um, anyway, yes. But uh, also, George C. Scott as General Turgeson. I'd read some piece of trivia where... Oh, he did so great. He's so good. But I read he's some piece so of trivia good. where uh, so much of his performance is him. Um, like, he did not want his performance to be as big as it was. And Stanley Cooper kept pushing it to be bigger and bigger and bigger. And... That sounds like Kubrick. Yeah. And so for a long time, George C. Scott was mad at Kubrick because he's like, you oh, made yeah. me look ridiculous. Uh, I think he's since came around on it because he is fantastic in this movie. But it is a big performance. It is a huge performance. And he's very funny. Kubrick loves pushing his actors beyond what they beyond their uh, comfort level. want to do. Yeah. You know, he may be my favorite director, but I am very much so aware of his flaws. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah. Uh, question. Mm. What do you think about James Earl Jones in this movie? Because, I mean, love James Earl Jones. He's amazing. But I'm also like, are you the token black person in this movie? Because I kind of feel like you are. And yeah, I don't. Uh, is there <laughs> is there a piece of trivia behind his casting in this movie? I mean, it's it's great to have a, just a, you know, a black actor in a role that I feel like at this time you would not expect to see one. Um and he does great with what he's given, but I don't yeah. know if there's like a specific sort of. Um, it's just one of those things he, where it's like, cast. it's kind of just that, that confusing aspect of like, on the one hand, it's really, really great, great to have representation in a movie like this where they're otherwise, it otherwise probably would have been all white people. So it's great mm-hmm. that there is an attempt at it, but it's also kind of like, oh, I mean, Yeah. I, I, it's, I don't know. It's just a weird, it's a weird, it's a weird thing that mm. I don't really know how I feel about it, but it's a very common thing that happened for a long time, but mm. it had to happen in order to get where we're at. So, you know, anyway, yeah. we yeah. don't need to talk about that too much, but I just, I don't know. It was just a, a thought that I had watching this. Yeah. Um, oh, pff, wait. Oh, I didn't know that. Sorry, I was trying to look up how many uh, Pink Panther movies there are, but then oh. I saw that. But then I saw that Peter Sellers was in Lolita, which is another Stanley Kubrick oh, film yeah, that I was. actually never finished because that movie really bothers me. Um, <laughs> really, why on earth would that movie bother? It, you? Yeah, I I could not. I I I could not. Yeah, I I just I I, I started <laughs> watching that movie. I think I only got like fifteen minutes in. I I would like to yeah. finish it at some point. Lolita the book is amazing fantastic yeah. book that you finish it and you instantly want to go and take a scalding hot shower mm. um but yeah i don't know how well i mean i i don't know if there's any way to successfully adapt it to film and i certainly don't know mm. if kubrick was the person to do it but i've never seen the movie in full so I don't yeah know. kubrick has adapted lots of books to screen now that mm. i think about it because this one is loosely Adapted from a book. Lolita is. Um, Paths of Glory, I think, is loosely adapted from mm. a book. The Shining yeah, is adapted from a book. was a short story, I think. Are all of his films adapted from a book? Now that I think... No, I don't think Eyes Wide Shut... And I'm going to have to do research about this later. I'm like, were, was he... Were all mm. of his books... Or were all of his movies adapted from books? Possibly. Uh, I mean, maybe. Great ideas got to start somewhere. Um, also, this movie was uh, apparently Peter Sellers' first role after the first Pink Panther movie came out. He did oh, the Pink Panther, and then he did this, <laughs> which I think is great. Yeah, um, good for him. 
But anyway, I'm not going to go off on tangents in that direction. Then I'll just start Googling things and then she and I will just start having an <laughs> I'm incredibly scrolling. unfocused conversation. Yeah, yeah let's get her. I'm um, scrolling through Peter Sellers as IMDb as we're talking and I should probably click yeah. out of that. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that, I think that maybe a controversial opinion because mm. Peter Sellers is obviously killing it, killing it in this movie. I think that George C. Scott might be my favorite performance. I mean, but I, I don't think that would be a, a wrong or even controversial opinion just because his performance is so good <laughs> and so iconic. Yeah. So which, which and the of, thing is too, I mean, two of Peter Sellers' characters are playing basically the most rational person in the room. You know, Mandrake is a little bit, his Britishness is a little bit played for laughs, but for the most part, he, you know, he is the rational counterpoint to um, Ripper's craziness. And then the president, Miffley or whatever his name is, he is the sort of adult adult in the war room who's trying to solve everything. And, and the craziness is kind of bouncing off of him. So it's not surprising when it, that George C. Scott would be a much more memorable character because he is playing the, the hugeness he's playing this very eccentric character which of peter sellers characters is the most engaging to you i mean in, well i mean i think doc it would have to be dr strangelove right because that's the really? one that is the most um the biggest it's not dr strangelove most. for me oh interesting Mm-mm. which one is it for you i love his performance as the president i think his performance as the president is absolutely i i mm. love it I think it's so great yeah i mean he's great it's just that he is because he is the kind of rational competent one you know it's just not as memorable because it is the straight man i that think the, that's yeah, why it is, is memorable for me of. that's why it is memorable for me because so many of the performances in this movie in my opinion are like very over the top and outrageous mm-hmm. and his just stands out as like no i am this person who's like trying to maintain order <laughs> but at the same time I'm not really very good at it. <laughs> um, and I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm trying really hard. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I really, I mean, obviously all of his characters mm-hmm. and his performances in each of them are, are great. Um, but I like him as the president, I think. N- not that I like him as the president the most, but that's my favorite performance of his mm-hmm. in this film. Of the three, yeah. Yeah. Um, anything else? Are there any particular moments that you want to talk about anything like that made you laugh or anything that made you cry (laughs) (laughs) nothing made me cry in this movie specifically apart from just general despair over the state of the world (laughs) (laughs) and the fact that it's been what like 80 years and the cold war is still Uh, like a relevant thing yeah um trying to think if there's any like major parts of this movie that we've not yet talked about um did we talk about the introduction of general turdenson and his quote-unquote secretary (laughs) we did briefly we We talked about the phone call back and forth is she the only woman in this movie is there any other woman i'm pretty sure she's the only woman yeah 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 Yeah. which is pretty funny she'll Um, probably be one of the lucky ones chosen to go into the underground bunker (laughs) lucky Lucky her her. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I also love the logic behind that of like, by this math, if we have this many men and that many women, then within like, what was it? Within like 20 years, we should be back to the same level of population we have <laughs> like, now. And I'm I like, don't know if that math insane. checks out. <laughs> like, that's definitely not true at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> not even close. <laughs> oh, crazy. my goodness. Yeah. The, the, um, Again, with like how impressive it is, the the level of detail that they have in the the military protocol and um, Mm -hmm. how all the the codes work and all the uh, buttons and circuitry and everything like that. I'm very curious how all of that was put together. Also, I love the footage at the beginning over the opening credits where Mm -hmm. a plane is being refueled midair and... I heard at one point, I cannot cite any source for this, but that the original intention for this was basically two planes having sex with each other in midair. <laughs> That's mm. kind of a visual representation, uh, which I think works very well uh, and sets yeah. a, the tone for the movie. Yeah. So that was yeah, pretty great. Um, I think that checks out, I feel like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, do they, do, they about- do a good job with the, the special effects in this movie. Mm-hmm. in general i yeah, mean a lot of totally. it i think is probably stock footage and models but it looks looks pretty good we also have to mention the 
incredible set design for the war room which was done by Mm, ken adam who is known for doing really great set design in other movies he he did some for some like iconic sets in james bond movies and things like that and it's just the the circular table with the big low circular light over it and then the big Mm -hmm. um you know the big boards that show the maps and everything it's just it's the boards are huge it, they're, they're so big so big <laughs> i don't know how it's oh at gosh. all practical for strategy making <laughs> but it's Man. just such an incredible incredible look that is so iconic and influential on other films and yeah Ken i feel Adam like it also i feel like it also begs the question of what else exists in this room mm-hmm. like it almost feels like nothing else exists nothing else exists the except table. there's randomly a buffet table off to one side uh, yeah like what <laughs> <laughs> but i i just love how like when we're looking directly at the table mm-hmm. nothing else exists we have some shots where we're away from the table and we see that there are other things in there but when we're specifically at the table it's like no we're just in our own little you know confined space mm-hmm. and it's just yeah. us here and it's you know? very much that sort of sinister idea of like here are the secret here's the secret meeting room where all the fate of the entire world is decided everyone's just coming all these people are just coming together to make these oh momentous decisions you just made me think of something when you were saying top secret that mm-hmm. made me think of the little envelopes that they got in the airplane which made me think oh, of yeah. their little care packages that were like you get one little gun and then you get like <laughs> this many sandwiches you get this type of medicine and ointment and blah, blah, i love blah. the part where it's like and you get uh they they each get like three sets of lipstick and three sets of nylons <laughs> which not a whole lot of um clarification on how they're supposed to use them but you know they're come military in men. They, they'll, <laughs> they'll they'll know <laughs> but i that made me get to the point of i wanted to ask you i don't mm. know if this is just like an ongoing gag just to be funny or if there's some sort of thematic theme to this, or thematic theme, <laughs> if there's some if there's some theme to this being used that I'm just not aware of, mm-hmm. everyone is chewing gum in this movie. Everyone is <laughs> chewing gum in this movie. Yeah, because the, the, the the fighters or like the the airplane people, mm-hmm. the, like each of them gets six packs of gum, <laughs> ridiculous or six amount of, of bubble gum. And then and then uh, Turgidson is downing gum the entire movie, and I think we see Ripper having like. Maybe it's not Ripper, but we at least see one other person. Maybe it's Dr. Strangelove. I don't know. But there's lots of gum in this movie. And I'm just kind of like, I don't know if this is like a military thing or a 1964 thing that I'm not aware of or if it's just a joke that's yeah. meant to be funny. It could be an American but... thing. Like, you know, Americans are always chewing gum. It could be like, I feel like chewing gum kind of gives you that idea of someone who is not in a hurry to go along with your idea about how they don't uh-huh. seem to have a great awareness of how urgent everything is. It just gives you the kind of nonchalant, you know, oh, I'm just going to sit here, chew my gum, you know, instead of being and like. And it makes me think of when I was in school growing up too, it was like, no gum, no gum. Maybe gum is something where it's like, if you're if you're a high level official, it, yeah, it, it, it gives makes a you sense of informality. If you're chewing gum, mm-hmm. yeah, it gives a sense of informality, and also, I mean, it's a it's a childish candy, you know, like kids what? chew gum. I'm I'm, I'm not uh, obviously I chew gum, but like you know, <laughs> I feel like gum is like it, it, the association is with kids. So this mm, idea that okay. these high level adult military men are sitting in a room chewing gum, it just it makes them look a little bit childish. Yeah, I mean Turgidson is freaking like he's. I mean he's, he's a, chewing so much gum. He's a you know a horny fifteen year old boy trapped in the body of a you know military. Is that general. what is that what horny fifteen year old boys do? They chew lots of gum. <laughs> they chew gum and they you know want to abandon their uh, essential duties in order to hang out with their hot secretary. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I love how I love how we have that moment where it's kind of him and his uh him and his secretary in his room or whatever mm-hmm. and then it's like okay this is interesting that she's answering the phone or whatever and then it's revealed in the middle of her phone conversation that it's 3 a.m. <laughs> it's yeah. like, there's no way they would be going over paperwork in yeah. his room at 3 a.m. <laughs> yeah I mean it's like, the if bikini it's 5 didn't tip PM, you off. Yeah. maybe that story checks out if it's 5 p.m. if it's 3 a.m. forget it no. like why even bother <laughs> it's such a like it is so easy to see through that story i don't think oh anyone. my gosh totally <laughs> also i can't believe that's her underwear because it looks like a swimsuit <laughs> but it does i don't know I, what... I was thinking it was a bikini but also why would she be wearing a bikini at 3 exactly so who knows 
<laughs> man, it's like, it's like a, what do you do after you're done having sex? Put on a bikini. <laughs> yeah, like, just I don't out. know. <laughs> Chill on the bed. Um, but anyway, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's just so many funny moments in this movie that are just like coming back to me. But mm -hmm. it's it's interesting to me how when we're talking about it, I'm remembering all of these funny moments. But when I finished the movie, my emotions in my heart and soul were like, I am depressed. I am not. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like that was a fun time. But now that I'm talking about it, you know, hours later, or whatever it is, yeah. I'm like, oh, actually, this is, like, it is pretty funny this, once you get removed from it a little bit. Yeah, this movie, to me at least, I mean, maybe, maybe not the case for you, but for me, this is not a movie where I'm frequently laughing out loud. Like, there are funny oh, yeah. moments, mm -hmm. but I'm not going, ha, 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 ha. I'm more going, <laughs> oh, my gosh, this is so absurd. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. also, I feel ill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, anyway. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to watch some Veep tonight. Veep is definitely way more mm. like direct comedy than this, but yeah, do this it. is putting me in the mood for some for some Veep. <laughs> um if anyone doesn't know what Veep is, google it. Go it's a great, it's great it's a great HBO comedy show starring Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Tony Hale and a bunch of other amazing people. Um but anyway, okay, let's let's go ahead and uh move on if that's all right with you, Geneva. Sure. Um so just to kind of jump in a little bit to how this movie was uh, critically received. So this movie has a 97 nice. on Metacritic and a 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. Very nice. So this movie is very highly revered by many people, uh, us normal people and, sit and critics alike. So <laughs> that's pretty cool. So this movie was nominated for four Oscars. It was nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor for Peter Sellers, of course, mm. and Best Adapted Screenplay. Um, I don't know what it was going up against that year uh, because I feel like this movie did have potential to win all of these categories, but I don't know what it was going up against. Yeah, so. this is a great question. I'm going to look it up right as we speak. Yeah, See what do. won that year. Okay, so the winner um, that... Oh, gosh. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> the winner that year for picture and director and actor was uh, mm. My Fair Lady. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of my reaction, I don't too. like My Fair Lady. Yeah, yeah. I Apologies to anyone out there who likes My Fair Lady because it is a very respected and beloved film, but it's not a, I not like a the favorite costumes. of mine. That's pretty much the extent. I'm like, <laughs> I like the costumes. Yeah. Wow, uh, I can't believe this lost to My Fair Lady. I know, I know. What not a bummer. A, one of those wins that is does not age super well. What about um, adapted, screenplay? adapted screenplay? Adapted um, screenplay lost to Beckett, which I've never seen. Never seen. But um, I know is highly regarded, so. Yeah. Dang. That that puts a sour taste in my mouth. But, you know, <laughs> the Oscars only get things right very infrequently, it's so it's, true. it's fine. Um, all right. So as we've kind of alluded to, this movie is often considered to be one of the best films of all time. And in 1998, it was actually um, ranked 26th on the American Film Institute's list of the best American movies. And in 2000, it was listed as number three on the American Film Institute's funniest American films. So very highly regarded. And also in 1989, the United States Library of Congress included Dr. Strangelove as one of its first 25 films selected for preservation in the National Film Registry. Wow. So, yeah, this movie is a very highly revered mm -hmm. and basically has become like a historical document. Yeah, it's an all-time so, classic. Definitely all-time classic. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of a little bit of the stats on that. So I pulled, um, I pulled two reviews. One, I have no idea who wrote it. I know it's from Time Out. So there you go. Uh, can't tell you what year. Can't tell you who. I don't know. But, <laughs> but it says, perhaps Kubrick's most perfectly realized film, simply because his cynical vision of the progress of technology and human stupidity is wedded with comedy. Kubrick wanted to have the antics end up with the custard pie finale, but thank heavens he didn't. The result is scary, hilarious, and nightmarishly beautiful, far more effective in its portrait of insanity and call for disar disarmament than any number of worthy anti-nuke documentaries. So I thought that was a, a good way of describing kind of mm. the, how it juggles a lot of these different themes, but does it in a very unexpectedly successful sort of way. Yeah, and I think that um, does that's a really good exp um description of the ending too and how it mm -hmm. it doesn't end in a sort of 
neat conventional manner it is Mm -hmm. very disjointed and jumbled and frightening honestly Mm -hmm. um but it is intentional and that's one of the reasons that the film has so much power right yeah um and then the next one this one is actually an old one so it's from 1964 when the movie actually came out which i always try to find movies or reviews that are from the Mm. actual year yeah it's always interesting to hear Yeah, so this comes from James Powers at The Hollywood Reporter, and he said, Baleful and brilliant, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, will outrage a predictable percentage of the population and enthrall an even greater percentage. Dr. Strangelove is not an assault on American nuclear policy. It is an aghast look at the entire world, a world in which the demonical word overkill is accepted as a logical point of discussion. Mm. I loved that review. I thought that was really, really well said. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Good job, James Powers at The Hollywood <laughs> Reporter from 1964. Uh, Geneva Probably RIP. I, Geneva and I absolve you. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, bring it back to our Amadeus yeah, episode. Call back to our last episode of Amadeus <laughs> if you haven't listened to it. Um, yeah, that'd be funny if someone just listened to this and hadn't listened to all like, so was like why is, why is Tatum about? laughing and absolving people anyway um so yeah just to close out uh this movie is just it, I just think it's a masterpiece I've never seen a movie honestly that is like this that is just so successful in the way that it um just like creates satire um but in a way that is so funny but also really really just you know, I keep using this adjective, but chilling at the same time and, and very relevant, not just then, but still relevant now. And I think will still be relevant for years, if not <laughs> centuries to come. Um, but yeah, I just think it's a really profound film and I think it's incredibly well made, incredibly well acted, you know, as Geneva mentioned, the set design and, and um, you know, just the performances and all of these different things. So um yeah this is definitely a movie where I finish it and I it sticks with me like I think about it for a while and and I like movies that once they're done I still think about them for hours and perhaps even days to come so yeah this movie is is a masterpiece and and I'm glad we were able to um talk about it today so yeah what about you Geneva yeah uh, I agree well said I mean I'm trying to think of like there's one specific moment that that sticks out to me more than others which is hard to say because there are so many great scenes and great exchanges um that it really is hard to single out one I mean I we didn't talk about it too much but the the scene with Mandrake attempting to place a phone call to the president which he hopes will resolve the entire situation and this one guy who's with him is just refusing to help him and until the very last minute refusing to um shoot a coca-cola machine to get him the money that he needs in order to place this call and he's like you're gonna have to answer the coca-cola corporation which yep. is just very funny i remember watching it the first time and just oh my goodness the suspense you know i there's sort of an inevitability to the way this movie ends but at the same time i didn't fully know how this movie was going to end so i really was kind of on, on the edge of my seat at that point in the movie being like well are they gonna are they gonna make it are they gonna make it and then it's just oh no of course they're not gonna make make it because this whole movie is murphy's law you know everything that can go wrong is going to go wrong and it's all gonna mm-hmm. end in annihilation so yeah great movie <laughs> definitely yeah is one that has stuck with me since seeing it for the first time and I'm really glad I got a chance to see it again yeah yeah I'm glad we got to talk about it um yeah so that is uh that is our Dr. Strange Love discussion Geneva can you tell us what we will be talking about next week Yes, I'm very excited to talk about this movie um I've actually only seen it once before and so I'm Looking forward to rewatching it because it really, really stuck with me for a long time after the first time I watched it. So we are going to be covering Brief Encounter from 1945. Yeah. So, uh, I yeah, I have no idea. I have, I have, I have no <laughs> feelings about this discussion for next week because I don't even know what yeah. movie this is. So I'm like, I yeah. heard of it. But I that's it. I will be curious to see your 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 thoughts on this. Um, yeah. yeah, we'll see. So we'll see, but. Should be a good time regardless. We always have a good time. Do you always always have a good time, listener? We hope so. If you don't, send us an email (laughs) at (laughs) yourfangology. 
Anyway, okay. I that's it for this week, guys. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at yourpickpod at gmail.com. Our theme song was composed by Joel Rushton, and our podcast graphic was designed by Kara Shin. If you like this show and want to hear more, please rate and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We're excited to have you on this journey with us. Until next time. Thank you.